everyone. Welcome back to the How to Podcast series. You know, the place where we talk to podcasters about podcasting. How meta is that, right? Oh, but that's fun, though, because we get to explore new podcasts. You get to hear about great people in podcasting. Robbie is here. Robbie's got some great news about his show and what he's doing with his show. If you've ever thought of rebranding, Robbie is going to be here to show you the way to teach you as the great almighty rebrander, I'm going to call you. Robbie's here as our guest co-host on the show. Robbie, welcome to our podcast series. David, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> I make up all these intros on the spot. I don't even know what I'm going to say next. So um, it's always entertaining to listen, listen back and go, well, that guy needs some coffee. Um, Speaking of which, they, they could buy you a cup. They could buy me a coffee. Yes, you thank you for that. You're welcome. Good reminder. Uh, Robbie, uh, great to have you here. Uh, tell everybody... A, where you are in this big world, and B, tell us about your podcast. So I live in the northeast of the U.S., 45 minutes outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. And I've been hosting a podcast. I started working on it nine years ago, and it launched eight years ago. It's called On the Schmooze. It's about leadership and networking. And I interview talented professionals who achieve success in their field or industry, and I get them to answer probing questions that has them sharing some untold stories about leadership and networking. Often they're sharing things with me on air and coming to realizations that they had never had before, uh, which is really fun. I have a master's in social work and sometimes there's moments of feeling like this is a therapy session and they're on my couch, but I'm rebranding as you mentioned uh, and we can get more into that in a moment. But I will say that like this eight year project has been really thrilling and I'm so glad that I stuck with this. I love listening to your voice, Robbie. It's like your the, the sound of your voice. There's something cool about that. It's got that nice kind of bottom ending sound. I'm like, it sounds so great on the mic. So nice to have you here. Um, so, okay. I love the word schmooze, by the way. I have to say that. That's such a good word. I think we need to use that more often. How did you come up with the original concept for the show originally back in the day? How did this all happen? So I was employed in a nonprofit organizing fundraising events and doing major gift work. And I also was running a meetup group that had multiple events uh, a month. And I was just running tons and tons of events. And I started teaching people how to network at events. And I did this talk pro bono initially. And then I started getting paid. And I had this like five years where I was taking days off from my day job to go somewhere and speak for a couple hours and getting some money. And eventually at the end of 2014, I left my day job to pursue speaking full time and building, you know, a real business around this entrepreneurship. Around that time, I started listening to Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income. And I would say three months later, I I was just like, I found myself saying yes to every idea I heard. <laughs> and one of the concepts on the show, though, that he kept crediting Jason Van Orden for, which is the person who helped him get started when he, he, uh, he um, Jason was the host of Internet Business Mastery and, and Pat went through a program that Jason ran. And uh, Jason had told him there's a difference between just in time and just in case. And so I realized like I needed to just focus. I needed to stop just getting excited about every single guest and their idea and get focused back on why I left my day job, <laughs> which was to build a speaking business. And I needed to shift audiences. I didn't want to have the same nonprofit audience that I'd had for those five years. So I needed to broaden my reach. And I was like, oh, I should host a podcast. So this is 2015 now. It feels like a long time ago, but, you know, Pat Flynn had been doing it for years before that. So it was it was relatively new, but he was definitely the pioneering in that in that group of people who pioneered. So I started working on a podcast that summer and I started interviewing that fall. My first child was born in December of 2015. So I paused everything and really took some time off. So I ended up releasing my shows the following summer into the fall and I committed to 50 a year and my very first episode numbers were 000, 001, 002, and 003 because I needed a three number placeholder because I, I was committed to getting to two years, 100 episodes. 
And I really think starting out with that commitment kept me going. And it wasn't about how many people were listening or my downloads. Or, I didn't care. It was just about building the best show I could. So one of the things I always tell people is don't judge me for my first three, judge me for my last three attempts. So, you know, if you go back and look, listen to those first three episodes, uh, it's, it's different than the last three times I've interviewed someone because you get a lot more experience by just doing it. So that's how it all sort of started. And I was so nervous, Dave, when I, the first few times, I, I, I think it's important to share that because I was interviewing local leaders, people I knew personally, and it was back when we were using Skype to do this, which I had. I actually got on Zoom and Zoom became a big part of my life later on when I, I, I became a virtual event design consultant and an executive Zoom producer in 2020. But I was on Zoom already years earlier because people couldn't find their login information for Skype. And it was stressing them out and stressing me out, trying to send the invite and make sure they could find it because they could log in. Oh my gosh. But we the first few we were on Skype, I would turn my camera on, we would chat for a few minutes, but when it was time for recording, I told them I had to turn off my camera for better bandwidth, but so the recording would be better. But truthfully, it was because I was staring down at a piece of paper with the questions. <laughs> And all they were going to see was the top of my head on the ca on the camera. So I, I didn't want that to happen. But then I went to a conference in July, like right after I launched. I had 10 episodes recorded because I believed I had heard all the stats about how few people get past 12. So I was like, I wasn't going to launch until I had, you know, 10 recorded. I launched with four. And then I had I had basically another month and a half's worth kind of ready to go. And I went to a National Speakers Association conference here in the States, and I was committed to getting 10 more people to say yes. And then I realized everyone here is a speaker. They'll all say yes. So I raised my sights a little bit, and I, I only asked people who had spoken on the main stage, who were a past president of a national association, or had a million dollar business. And I left with 12 people saying yes, and 10 booked within the next few months. And that very quickly elevated who I was able to invite as a guest because people would recognize other guest names. And within within a year, I, I literally could just expand out. And it was an incredible networking tool. I took kind of a past tense because I am I am uh, in the process of rebranding. So it's a little it's kind of a bittersweet moment to talk about the growth of this. But I almost I almost stopped that show and started a new show at the two year mark. And I got really excited about a new show. I even went and got um, trademark for the title, which I don't have a trademark for my current one. Like, it's, I don't know why I was so committed to this idea. And I talked to a coach and he basically said, you're just starting over because you you don't know what comes next. And you, it's more comfortable for you to go back to the things you know how to do. And so I committed back to the original show and the last six years have been just really, really wonderful. Wow. Okay. Well, a lot of things in there. I love the idea that you planned out um, your numbering for your episodes to give you a target that you're going to get into those triple digits. That's super amazing. That's a great, a great mindset to have at the beginning of your podcast. And also that you planned out like 50 episodes in your mind. You're like, hey, I'm going to commit to 50 and that's my goal. Um, I think I talked to a new podcaster last week and when I mentioned having a calendar and thinking of for the year that their eyes kind of got big, like, oh, I thought I hadn't just like planned for the next week. And I'm like, you need to think long term because you got to kind of have a plan and there's seasonality. You can build podcasts around seasons if that works for your content. But just have a plan that takes you further than the next few weeks. That's going to keep you going. So there's a lot of good tips in there for a new podcaster to think beyond that typical pod fade 7 10 12 episodes i love how you approach that you know um you commented earlier about the, my microphone <laughs> and quality um yeah. so this is actually part of part of the decision making in 2015 when i was getting the gear and so complicated and part of why i wanted to do a second show and i told myself i couldn't for two years because I got excited like within months of a second show was because once you get past the mental and tactical hurdle 
of hosting a show, well, then why not host another show? Why not? Right? It's like, well, you know that better than most. I know the problem. <laughs> I have that problem. <laughs> so I put myself on like a no, no new shows for two years, like kind of waiting list there. But um, I was testing out, you know, what should I buy? And Pat Flynn uh, had this incredible video where he really went through five different microphones on the video. And the one he uses, which is the one I use, had the best tone. And mm -hmm. it was expensive. It was expensive because not only is the mic expensive, but there's a lot of gear you have to buy in order to connect it to the computer. And there's a boom mic thing. And there's there's just like extra wide. It's just, it's not a plug and play. Like it's not a Blue Yeti. Blue Yeti, mm -hmm. literally USB, right? Boom, done. Right. Um, now there's things with Blue Yeti people get wrong, <laughs> which I talk to people all the time about. I committed, I was like, no, I'm going to get this. You know, it was like $800 all told, wow. seven, $800. Wow. Like it was, and I didn't have any money. I was starting out a business. So I said, you know, I'm going to just, I have to do this long enough to make this mic worth it. I am still nine years later using the same microphone. <laughs> Literally nine years ago this month that we're recording this is when I started, um, I bought this and I recorded it. So I'm going to say it was well, well worth the investment. Um, I've moved with it multiple times. Now, finally, I'm back to a stationary spot. Uh, I don't think this mic's going to give out for a while. I mean, this has been an incredible investment. Now, the downside is that this microphone has to be in the frame with me. If I turn the mic even away a little bit, you can change. Oh, wow. You're just like gone. Now, wow. I needed that to be dramatically different because I was recording in the beginning in a living room no closed space, no closet, nothing like that. Windows right on a main street across the street from a hospital in a hospital district. So buses, cabs. Um, I was a mile away from a baseball stadium. People would come by in drunk crowds. Col I was living on a college campus surrounded by college students. I was, my wife was a director of Res Life. So really needed something that would not pick up all that background noise. Yeah. A siren going by all that stuff that's why i think the investment was really really worth it i have not tried to sell people on this mic since i've only gotten i think two people have gotten it and, and it's really because of the quality of the, the how, how it diminishes background noise so they were like okay fine you know what that is i i need that for where i'm living but um it's it's, a, it's an expensive investment and there's lots of new options out there in the market. But I was like, I had to keep going because I had invested all this money up yeah. front. Um, I mean, I didn't even have a light. The longest time I remember I had um, a naked bulb, like a lamp without the the yeah. shade, uh, leaning against the back of my my monitor. Um, I mean, I, 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 I slowly got the other kinds of, of equipment and background and all that. But um, I if you can invest in a better quality mic, it will change the experience for the audience. And that's also true for now virtual programming like Zoom calls and such because our brains cannot handle it. If the audio is a little glitchy, ugh, no, it needs to go. And if they stick around, they actually, there's some studies that they think you're less educated um, because of your quality of your, your mic. But if your video is a little glitchy, our brains kind of fill that in and, and it doesn't seem to impact the message. So makes you know get a get a good mic like invest in that yeah that's smart that's really smart when you hear people talking on a podcast and it sounds like they're in another room you're like i and i'm having a hard time connecting with you because i'm always wrestling with the sound in my head i'm like i can't i can't make it work i'm, I'm used to a certain because i listen to other shows and they have a certain quality and i'm expecting your podcast to be at least equivalent yeah, all the other shows. I think that people who are guesting, and particularly if guesting is part of their strategy of marketing, they should invest as well. But there is some leniency around the guest versus the host. And the best explanation I got for this was thinking about like a call in radio show. The radio host has an incredible, you know, microphone, but the call in person. I mean, back in the day, they were on a payphone. <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah. it's really bad. So. But if guesting is a strategy of yours, then you should be just as ready for the moment as the host, because those are the episodes people are going to want to listen to to the end. And what's the point of getting picked for a show if people tune out because your audio is crappy? Yeah, I had a guest on my author podcast. And when I met with her, I'm like, 
I'm like, are you using your the, the mic in your laptop? And she's like, yeah, that's all I have. I'm like, well, I can only do so much with the sound, um, just so you know. And I released the episode for her. I sent her the early copy of it. And she's like, why does it sound so bad? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, we talked about this. You're using a microphone that's further away from you and it's picking up the room. There's a lot of things that are happening there. And that was earlier in my podcast. So I didn't have some of the tools we have today. And she was like, that sounded, that didn't sound as good as I thought it would. I'm like, well, that's what it sounds like. And I, I said, a microphone will make you sound better. So yeah, if you're going to guest on shows as, on a regular basis, yeah, as a support of your book or whatever you're doing, purchasing a microphone is a good, good idea. I think the other thing that threw me off early on was um, those first handful of people that I knew, I didn't have a really thoughtful process for booking them. You know, it was really like sent an email, they said yes. But then I was left scrambling to find a photo for them, hoping they had a good one on LinkedIn. Um, they didn't all have websites early. I mean, these were not people who were entrepreneurs. They were like people who had worked at the company or something. So it was still a scramble to figure out how to write the intro. Um, the whole first year I did everything. Um, I did, okay, I will say, I would not have moved forward until I found an editor I could work with. And I've been working with the same editor for nine years. Wow. So incredible relationship. I think I may have been on video with him once and a phone call twice and all that was early on. Um, I We don't talk regularly, it's all via email. He's built out a team. Um, I've referred so many people to him. So Joshua River uh, Rivers is, is amazing. So podcast guy media um but i i didn't want to do that part myself but short of that the first year i re-listened to the episode i did the show notes i added my own two cents to the conversation as part of my closing thoughts because i was not yet a comfortable interviewer and so it took me a while to get to the point where i could interject myself into the conversation smoothly while still airing like on the airing on the side of like more time for the for the uh, for the guest, um, but like even the way I frame a question or respond myself to it or give my own little story and then share the mic back to them, that took a lot of time to practice doing that thoughtfully. So at first, I would re-listen to the episode just so I would then share my three takeaways or points or something, and it was a tremendous amount of work even though I wasn't doing the editing. Um, Mm. A year in, I got a virtual assistant and I trained the virtual assistant. And over the years, I've had different assistants. I've had the same one for over four years now. And we recently changed like a year ago, like the way we do our show notes. And it's been incredible. She happens to really like my show. And I think that's a really important key. If you're going to have someone do your show notes, they should be someone who would want to listen to your show anyway. So mm-hmm. she pays attention and notices things um, that I, you know, wouldn't have necessarily picked up on or, or she also makes her top 10 list, uh, her top 10 favorite guests every year that we share. So we don't do an interview for the time, basically Christmas and New Year's, but I send an email with um, her top 10 so that people who missed what happened earlier in the year over the break can always listen to her top 10. That's a great idea, Robbie. I love that idea. Yeah, she writes a whole paragraph about why. I mean, like really from her voice, what it meant to her to hear that story or that perspective or the have, I mean, it's just been great. Hmm. So so that's been wonderful, but I had to figure out how to make it become less of a full-time job because I needed to earn revenue and the podcast was costing me money. It was building my network, but it wasn't helping me directly in the beginning years earn money. But I was really yeah. committed to it because it offered so many other benefits, but I needed to streamline it. And so one of the things I did very quickly was I, I'm using a, calendar, a calendar system called Schedule Once but it's similar to Calendly or any of these others. So I have a form and that form collects everything I need from a guest before they can even pick a date. Okay. So I send them the email inviting them and it has that link and then they, I mean everything. So what my assistant does is she opens a Google doc, she takes the little paragraph that they submitted 
And then she also goes to their website, their LinkedIn, and all their social sites and grabs the about section for all of them and copies and pastes those down below. And then from all that, and if they're an author, she'll go to their author page on Amazon. She'll grab all that and then write the intro. And people think that I have done incredible research because sometimes we mention something in the intro that is a fragment that was left behind in their Amazon bio because they uploaded the book eight years ago and they didn't update right their bio there. And so I mentioned something and they're like, wow, <laughs> how did you know that? <laughs> so I don't read every book. I, you know, I know some yeah. podcast hosts yeah. read them page. I don't do it because I'm lazy and because I don't think it's actually as good for the audience for me to say, nice. Dave, on page 35 of your third right. book, on the bottom in the footnote, if you yeah. don't know Dave's books, that's I've just right. lost the audience. So instead, I want to be curious. I want to ask mm. the question in the moment that I think my listeners would be wondering and I can't stay curious if I know all the answers already. So mm. I need to know enough about them to think that they'd be a quality guest. And I, I lean towards people who have a story to tell, not something to sell. And I've, I've done a better job over the years picking those kinds of guests. And then I ask them questions that they're not necessarily used to being asked. And I follow up. So I have my like idea of what the flow will be, but I also stay present. And I asked the follow up question, but the intake process is streamlined. Now we get the right image. We get all the social sites. I collect the mailing address. I don't mail them a thank you card right away because that's perfunctory, but I might mm -hmm. end up mailing them a birthday card or a congratulations card or a sympathy card based on something they posted on social. So having their address in my address book allows me to be spontaneous like that. But, um, I just, I think that finding a way to streamline this so you're not spending all this time back and forth emails trying to get, yeah. you know, their social stuff or their website or whatever it is, just really important. Now, if if the people listening to this, Robbie, are doing what I'm doing right now, they've just filled a page with ideas from you <laughs> as you're talking. It's like, oh, and I like this one, and I like this one. Like, I'm just trying to keep up with you here. This is amazing. Um, these are all lessons learned by doing the thing, right? Just, you didn't know how to do all this stuff at the first three episodes. No idea, right? These are all things you learn over time. Absolutely. And you, you have to figure out what will work for you. If I was committed to this two year process, uh, 50 episodes a year, right? hundred episodes that I needed to find a way to fit into my life while my life got busier and busier. And what's been interesting is I've been committed to this even when my business was tanking. So in 2020, even in February 2020, before the pandemic, I already had shifted and I was about to do a new talk. And the length of time it takes to get paid for any new talk can be months. And I had said to my wife, you know, last year I moved $10,000 into our house fund uh, might need to borrow that back <laughs> because you know, there's a delay between I got books, but I don't know when I'm going to get paid the full fee for these talks that I'm working on. And my podcast costs about $5,000 a year to run between the VA and the editor. And she went, okay, March, I don't have a business anymore. <laughs> and I had to cancel all the plans for the talk because the talk was about in-person networking at conferences, which is what I was talking about for 10 years beforehand, 11 years beforehand. Mm -hmm. But I have the most amazing spouse and she just had my back and was just like, yeah, of course you're going to keep doing it. So I kept like the podcast has been the backbone, the steady beat of a drum to my business, which has reinvented, I feel like almost annually since 2020. <laughs> um, but having that has been really a key. So the fact that I'm now shifting gears to a new show feels really momentous. And at first I didn't want to let go of the old show. I wanted to just start a new one. And I was going to do two episodes a month for each one of them. But I very quickly realized I had more than a year's worth of content already for the new show. So it didn't make sense. And I looked at what other people had done 
and I saw someone I trusted had shifted their show by rebranding the same RSS feed. And I thought like, okay, I'm going to do that. And so that's, that's where I am right now. I'm, I'm month, I'm like two months away from this rebranding taking place formally, but I've already started doing live stream recordings. I switched to live stream um, via StreamYard. I would say a couple of years ago. So I'm live streaming both one person interviews and three person panels for the new show. Wow. Okay. So the process of uh, rebranding, what are you learning in the process that could help somebody that's considering a rebrand? Any little things we should kind of maybe like beginning steps? Yeah. So uh, I was learning from Jeffrey Shaw. He was formerly the host of the Creative Warrior and now host of um, The Solopreneur. So I'm now forgetting the name of his new show. Um, but what he did was he actually moved between. Um, I want to get I want to get his the name of his book yeah. done, uh, his podcast. But um, oh, self-employed business. Um, okay. That's his new show. So. Um, for me, uh, the self-employed life. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I credit him correctly. So self-employed life. Yeah. So he went from the creative warrior show to the self-employed life on the same RSS feed. And when I realized what he was doing, which is what I'm going to do a little bit as well, is he was changing the graphic for individual episodes because he still had some episodes recorded for the older show, which is happening for me, too. I'm going to have a few of my older episodes being released in the fall, but I'm just going to change the episode graphic as the artwork for that episode yeah. as opposed to the whole show. But the landing page, as far as where all the old content lives, is gonna be the same page. I'm gonna just have different URLs pointing to it because I have nearly 400 episodes. And I believe the audience from my old show and my new show are the same audience. So I'm just gonna put it all in one place. I'm actually continuing the numbering because within, I'd say, a few months, okay. no one's going to remember how old the new one is, right? But I want there to be some longevity because the quality of the show matches to the how long you've been doing it. And I, I know there are some podcast hosts that's just constantly restarting and starting new shows and all. But it's like no one knows that you have eight years of experience. Then. Um, and I do think the quality of that show is going to be better because you have eight years experience. And I want people to see that. So um, I... That's been a big piece of it. But the actual rebranding of the main site, you know, on, let's say, Apple Podcasts, that's going to take place in September when I upload the first of the new episodes. And I've already written out like the new description and all new categories and all that. But it's actually fairly straightforward. I'm now hosted through Megaphone because I'm part of the marketing podcast network. You just hop on and switch out the graphic, the description, your categories and all that. And it'll just populate out to everything else. And then we make individual graphics now in, uh, for each episode. And so we'll continue doing that. Um, we'll just switch between those two branding. But by October, November, it'll just be the new show. And um, you know, anyone who stumbles across the older ones, like they, they still exist. They're on my website, they're on, they're on whatever you know, platform people are listening on. Um, show notes still all exist, all that. I'm gonna continue paying for that URL, you know. So I think don't let things die. You know, when my my TEDx talk came out in January 2020. It was about networking at events, at conferences. And I was like, I'm poised to be an overnight success 10 years in the making. And then two months later, no one needed to know how to do that. But I had put a lot of effort into launching the TEDx talk. I got 100 comments and 1,000 views in just the first month and a half. So when it, when it kind of fell on the cutting room floor, it still had all that movement and it was on a searchable platform. So NPR found it two years later and invited me to be on a show. So what I'm saying is even your old shows, that content is evergreen. Like we always record content that could be useful in the future, right? So don't let things just fade away. Like make sure there's still links that are working, um, that those sites still exist, that people can still, you know, go back through, listen, and then, and find you. Um, even if you let go, same thing with seasons, right? Like seasons might be on different topics. But really right now, uh, the reason I'm doing this, the new show is called the Biz Book Publishing Hub Podcast. And the Biz Book Publishing Hub is a resource that I created earlier this year because I have successfully launched three books, which each have received over 200 Amazon reviews. And I build these big launches. 
And yes, the books have also reached number one in 30 categories across four countries, but the real lasting impact are these reviews that are social proof and the process of getting the reviews had me in touch with likely prospects and referral partners, which led to new revenue streams um, over time. So I started on the side helping people do that for the last seven years. And my mentor sort of said to me last October, why are you not a book launch coach? And I was like, okay, you've asked me three or four times in seven years, I should probably consider this. So that's when I hosted my first Kindle cross promotion campaign around Black Friday. And I did it again this year around Amazon Prime Day. And I started doing research calls, which ended up being, yes, my launch process is unique and a referral network that I was looking for didn't exist, but everyone wanted to join one. So in January of 2024, I put up a form to have people join. And now there are more than 50 people in this amazing BizBook publishing hub. And they were all experts that help entrepreneurs navigate the complexities of writing, editing, publishing, and marketing a business book. So the podcast was my way of highlighting these experts. So initially, I was just going to do that interview one, you know, uh, per episodes twice a month. But I then did this campaign around Amazon Prime Day, and I offered a VIP option that included being part of an author panel on a live stream that was then repurposed as an episode of this new podcast. And 69 out of 77 books said yes to that option. And if you divide that by three, that's a lot of panels. (laughs) So I have more than 50 people who are experts and I have, you know, 20 plus panels. And then I'm going to do the same campaign in November and probably end up with 20 or more panels again. I was like, oh, wow, I have a lot of content. I cannot keep doing the old show. So that was the mental math was I need to let go of the old show, but I didn't want to let go of the longevity. So merging the two on the same RSS feed just became the right sort of logical next step. So, I mean, I have been repurposing older episodes this year. I've given myself some space. I've been doing every other week was a new episode. So that was also part of this transition was using some time to just share archive content. Um, And I, I, I really like that we can do that. Like we should honor the the older stuff, but that's how I've been thinking about this whole process. And now if people go to bizbookpublishinghub.com, they'll find all those amazing people. And as of this fall, there will be a link directing them to the page with all of the episodes. And then, um, that way I'm, I'm actually doing cross branding too. I'm, I'm branding it directly to a great reason. Yeah. So I, it's That's all good. coming yeah. together. <laughs> well, the one thing I think we forget about when we have a lot of episodes is that there's new people coming to our podcast every week, every episode. And they, this is their first time they've ever pressed play on an episode. You can have 400 episodes in the back catalog. They haven't heard one of them. They are just starting with what just came out today. Yeah. And to send them back into your catalog is a smart move. I think that's good. I did it once before I was writing my second book and I took 13 weeks off in order to hunger down and write the book. Um, And I picked 13 episodes from like the first five years and shared them as part of, um, you know, was uh, bringing these archives up. I called them encore episodes. And then this year I was like, wow, it's not more impressive for me to have 50 more a year later. Like if I had, 25 more. I'm still, I mean, no matter what, I'm near five, I'm near 400. I'm either just below or just above 400. So the wow factor is not changing. So I thought, well, I could slow down my content creation. And I decided to do every other episode starting in January and then archived episodes, the encore episodes, every opposite. But that also gave me the brain space to create the hub, which then led to me coming up with a whole new show. So in nine months, I went from like, I'm going to slow down to no, actually, I'm going to put out a ton more content. But now it's more focused. So, you know, the first show I've done for eight years was tangentially related to my business the entire time in the sense that I was meeting the kind of people I wanted to meet and I was sharing great content. So it was great networking it was good content to share. I was learning, I was getting better at this process. This new one, right off the bat, I have experts that are part of a hub that I've created they're paying to be part of the hub, a small fee monthly. Then we have the authors and the panels who paid a very tiny fee to 
be part of the hub and or the campaign and be on the show. And so mm. I I'm like super excited because I got a lot of sort of buy in from the guests right away. So I think that how they're going to push it out. And when I did my first live author panel earlier this week, it was the first time I had like nine people commenting throughout the 40 minutes um, on the live. Now I try to ignore it because I want to have good audio for the replay and not just talk to mm -hmm. the guests who are, you know, yeah. the, the people yeah. who are commenting. But yeah. it was because it was fellow authors who were part of the campaign and they're all now connected on LinkedIn. And so when it popped up and I had tagged three of them, they noticed it and they were like, oh, this is really exciting. And of course, they're all getting ready to be invited to be on a show too. So they want to tune in and see what it's like. And so I mean, and they they know a ton of authors and a lot of them work with authors. So it's very interesting how over time, you know, I've sort of found the right sort of niche for this, but yeah. I would not have been ready to do this, to take advantage of this medium in this way if I hadn't had all this in, like experience and comfort. Because initially someone said, we should do a monthly event with content. And I was like, oh, it's a lot to try to get people to show up and we should do a summit. I'm like, oh, summits, like all that content and no one has time to go to it and watch all those things. And I was like, oh, if there was a way to just like a steady stream of content that just kind of came out every week and I didn't have to worry about who showed up, that's a podcast. <laughs> it's a podcast. <laughs> Mind blown. There you go. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about um, just the, the communication to a listener who is expecting one thing but now the podcast has changed, uh, new direction, new everything. How are you communicating to an existing listener that the change is coming? Any thoughts around that? Yeah, for the first, I don't, maybe a few months, I'm not sure how many episodes, definitely the first eight. I will say the first eight author panels and um, the first handful of guest experts that I'm interviewing, the introduction acknowledges the rebranding and also acknowledges that these where these people are coming from. Either they're the experts who are part of the BizBook Publishing Hub, they're one of our partners, or they're authors who participated in this, this campaign, this Kindle cross-promotion campaign, which is also cross-promotion, both those things. Um, so I, and I sort of I sort of mention, you know, in depending on where it was in the timing, you know, after eight years of hosting, blah, 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 like on the schmooze, now I'm, you know, shifting. So I've been sort of acknowledging it. I also just made the decision that I'm going to keep the same music. So I bought a piece of music for that show. And I'm so that'll be familiar. Um, I'm going to open with the same like welcome to episode blah, blah, blah of I'll just change the name. Um, I, so I have a certain way that I always open. So I'm going to open the same way. And then I had a friend record sort of that intro voiceover guy thing. Um, I have a different friend <laughs> who's going to do that for the new show. And so I'm thinking like, I'll carry over some of those kind of it, what people are kind of used to the experience of it. Um, but I th also think people are not paying nearly as close of attention as we think they are because they listen to a lot of shows and what they're going to recognize is they, my name and, or the topic. So either one is going to draw them in. I don't think the history is going to matter to people once they're tuning in. So I don't worry about it too much. But there are a few things that I thought, well, why should I go stressing to find music again? Right. And all that. And I'm like, oh, this totally works. Like, why don't I just. So that's where I am. I have not yet actually gotten an episode fully like designed for the new show. I'm still like you know, six weeks away from it being live. So um but yes, that's that's my branding. And then I also for the image, you know, the podcast artwork that goes up on um, Apple Podcasts, et cetera. I my old one had my picture. So my new one has my picture as part of the branding, okay. completely different branding, like completely different color scheme and all that vibrantly. So but I thought, you know, there are people who just the crossover is me. Yeah, like I'm, right. I'm the unifier of all the things. <laughs> so, the, 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 the you know common denominator. So, um, so there is that too, like carrying things over that way. Um, but I don't think it'll actually cause that much confusion because I don't think people are paying as close attention as we hope they are. <laughs> in reality, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. That is very true. Um, that's exciting though to see that 
you can continue your podcast on. You don't have to start from zero again and rebuild an audience. This is a really smart way to go from one idea to another idea, but they still complement each other. I think that's a, this is a nice match. Yeah, my audience for my eight-year show has been mostly entrepreneurial women in their 50s and beyond who are looking to grow their impact and income through some kind of new revenue stream. That's the audience, the demographic that has hit reply to my emails that come majority of who shows up to the programming that I run. And then I always say parenthetically, and a few good men. <laughs> so, but it's mostly like a 45 plus year old who's kind of committed to sharing this knowledge they've they've gained over the last couple of decades in some new ways. And so they're like the inspiration that of who's on the show. Well, now I'm the same people are also have been or thinking about or are currently writing a book that will help them do that. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, uh, it really fits in. And I also do business growth strategy coaching. And I found that this audience of authors, it's a good time to have that conversation because if they're not clear about how that book fits with the offer that comes after the book, they may not even be clear what the offer is. You know, maybe it's changing. Then I can also be there to support them by offering some coaching packages for that. So I offer, you know, packages around launching a book getting those 50 plus reviews, building a pipeline. But I also created some great leads for the coaching work that I do. So I'm a multi-passionate entrepreneur in case you haven't figured that out yet. Yes, I can, <laughs> I can see this coming out of you. Yes, it's great. Um, okay, so one thing I'm doing with my podcasters every month is I do what I, I've been calling other people. You do the same thing, but it's my question of the month where I ask a question of the audience and inviting podcasters to respond tell us your name, the name of your show, and then answer the question of the month. And then I take all these little segments, I put them all together, mash them all up at the end of the month, I release it. And it's a question that I put out to my group, but really the most important part of this whole process is promoting other podcasters. And I want people to, to fall in love with another show. And if they leave my show to go there, then I'm fine with that. I hope they come back. But I do want to promote other people and I want people to fall in love with podcasting. So that's the reason behind it. So it's a thinly veiled attempt at, you know, just getting more people to listen to podcasts. So I'm going to get you to do this, Robbie, and I would love for you to do this for me. So I'm going to pull this segment out and use it over on a different episode. So again, introduce yourself, the name of your new show, and answer the question of the month, which simply is, do you listen to your own podcast? Yes or no? Why or why not? Okay, so I'm going to count you in. Are you ready? Do you have all the details now? You're good? In true podcaster fashion, you're always ready. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. This is Robbie Samuels. I'm the host of the Biz Book Publishing Hub podcast, where we interview experts who help entrepreneurs become successful authors and authors who will share why they wrote a business book and what was the ROI. My podcast, I'm not actually listening to them anymore because I have an amazing virtual assistant who is passionate about these topics and she listens and writes the most incredible show notes. It's been part of the streamlining fashion for me is that I I line up the guests, I record the episodes with them, and then I get to just let go and know that the rest of the process will be handled by my team. Uh, if I had to re-listen like I did that first year, it was an incredible amount of work and I would never have been able to maintain doing a show for eight plus years. Beautiful. Great answer. I like that answer. That's amazing. Uh, Robbie, what else are we missing as far as rebranding before we close? Any last closing thoughts for uh, somebody considering a rebrand of their show? I, I, I guess just be thoughtful and strategic about how you're doing this. Make sure the audience aligns with both your old show and your new show. Uh, bring them along. You know, if you've noticed, I actually have built a lot of sort of new fans for the show before it started by hosting other events and doing other activities. So people are kind of waiting for this to come out. Um, I also really think the live recording when you get comfortable enough to do that, uh, it's wonderful. It's just another way for more people to come across what you're doing and to see see that work. And then maybe they'll want to tune in and, and see, you know listen to the archived episodes for your other shows. So I, I'm a fan of kind of a mixed medium of the live and then the the recorded later. But I'm excited to talk to people about all this, you know, the processes behind the scenes, the main, maintaining, you know, high level 
of of service and 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 doing the work increasing you know, increasing our ability each time and not judging ourselves too harshly as we're on that learning curve and i just like you i want more people to feel comfortable hosting or guesting i think having a strong guesting strategy we all need guests so we want guests who are really prepared as well so i think anyone listening who's thinking about you know starting their own show or guesting more as a strategy for marketing what they do i say go for it commit like a serious amount of time to getting it right though. And don't just try it like a few times and kind of give up because you will, you will get better by doing it. Hmm. So as you listen to this, you've just had a masterclass from Robbie. Uh, make sure you listen to this again, because there's so many great tips in here that you can put into place for your podcast. Robbie, thank you for so being so gracious to provide all these great ideas and to uh, explain how you're rebranding your show. I think we've learned a lot by having you on. I can't wait to listen to the new episodes and celebrate with you as the, as the podcast relaunches as a, a new name and a new focus, but the same Robbie the yeah. whole time. I like that. Thanks so much, Dave. Appreciate being awesome. here. Awesome. Awesome. Everyone, all the information for Robbie and the new show and everything you need to know about Robbie in the show notes as always as well. We'll put links to all the podcasts we've mentioned to schedule one and all these great things. We'll have them all in the notes as well. So, Robbie, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast all the way through to the end. I love having these great guest co-hosts on the show to share their podcasts with you. You have some homework to do. And what I'm asking of you is to go check out our featured guest co-host today. And go over and listen to their podcast. The links are always in the show notes. I'd love for you to go and give them your love and support. And I think if we can all do that for each other, podcasting will be a lot more fun for all of us. So it's time to do what you've asked others to do for you. It's time to do for this guest co-host. Links in the show notes. Go over and check out their show and leave them a review. Do the follow. Go listen to their episodes in full. The entirety of an episode which again shows to the apps that it's a good podcast because you're going there and you're staying to the end. Probably one of the best ways you can help a podcaster grow their audience and be shown to more people is by simply going and listening wherever you listen to the very end, like you're doing right now here. This is the perfect way to signal to wherever you're listening on, this is a podcast worth promoting. And all of the apps want you to stay on as long as possible. So go over and listen to our guest co-host episode and uh, leave them some feedback. If they have a buy me a coffee, send them a coffee. If they have a speak pipe, send them a voice message. If they have an email, send them an email. If they're on Instagram, send them a d direct message. Do something to support our guest co-hosts. They've given up their time to be here with you, to be here with me. And we can give that back to them with time and attention, our love, our support. Thank you for doing all that for me as well. Here on the How to Podcast series, we'll talk to you soon for our next episode. <laughs>